Hello, and welcome to our discussion, how COVID-19 is shaping the future of retail banking, part of the Milken Institute's COVID-19 conference call series. First, a couple of housekeeping announcements. This call is being recorded and will be made available online tomorrow. We will reserve time during our call to answer audience questions. Questions can be submitted in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen through the Q&A feature. Each week, a diverse group of leaders explore different aspects of the coronavirus challenge and outline creative and shared solutions that can activate the Milken Institute network for positive impact in response to this pandemic. Previous calls have covered topics from vaccine development to strategic philanthropy to the market implications of the coronavirus. Today, we are having a conversation with thought leaders in retail banking about how COVID-19 is affecting their customers, their business, and their industry. My name is Mike Pivovar, and I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Financial Markets, one of the centers of the Milken Institute. At our center, we conduct research and construct programs designed to facilitate the smooth and efficient operation of financial markets, to help ensure that they are fair and available to those who need them when they need them. Since the onset of the COVID-19 crisis, the Center for Financial Markets has been engaging lawmakers, regulators, and administration officials regarding economic support and financial assistance measures for individuals and small businesses directly affected by the pandemic. In addition to providing immediate relief to those in need, we're also encouraging policymakers to build a more resilient economy to withstand future pandemics and other adverse economic shocks in the future. So far, we've developed 25 specific proposals in six different areas, such as providing access to capital for small businesses in economically distressed communities and building more resilient infrastructure through local and national public-private partnerships. You can find more information about the Center for Financial Markets by going to our website at milkeninstitute.org. There, you can also find information about the work of our colleagues in the other Milken Institute centers and updates on all of our COVID-19 efforts. Today's conversation with our distinguished panel of, of retail banking experts is an example of how we at the Milken Institute benefit and learn and then refine our thinking to guide our work from listening to thought leaders in the financial sector. So let's get started. Mary, you lead consumer and small business banking for Wells Fargo where you oversee more than 90,000 employees that work in more than 5,000 different retail branches and office locations throughout the United States. I can't imagine how much time and effort it takes to prepare for and respond to something like the COVID-19 pandemic for such a, a large operation. So please tell us about what you have done and what you are doing. Um, thanks, Mike, and it's wonderful to be here. Uh, thank you for uh, letting me join you. Um, it's been probably the most comprehensive and fast moving uh, response to anything that, um, that I could imagine. Uh, we have looked across our network at everything we do and how we do it, what our customers need, what's most important to them now. Uh, we've looked at, you said over 5,000 branches, we've closed, pull over 25% of those and change the format in all of them that are open. We've enabled across Wells Fargo more than 200,000 of our employees to work from home out of 270,000. Many jobs that we had not contemplated would we be work from home um, uh, jobs, but are, are actively um, contributing now. We've thought about what is most important to customers now, whether it be access to stimulus funds, um, the, the set aside, temporary set aside of negative balances so that people could get to their money, um, cashing checks for non-customers, even uh, in light of what we're doing in terms of safety for team members, accommodations, customer accommodations across the consumer space in lending small business, the mobilization of thousands of team members to respond to PPP, uh, the payroll protection program and take care of small business needs. So it really spans the, um, uh, the, the universe of opportunities for small businesses, uh, customers, uh, whether they're in person or not. And we still have a lot of them who want to be in person and we want to make sure that's a safe environment. Um, so I, ne I never thought I would set up a program to go into uh, administrative buildings at night and collect hand sanitizer that might be there to get them out the branches where we need it. But 
you know, it, it, we do what it takes and, um, and it's been a real team effort. Great, thanks. So, so Dan, you're, you're the chairman and CEO of Professional Bank and its, its parent, uh, Professional Holding Corp, uh, where you lead one of the fastest growing depository institutions in Florida. And you recently uh, successfully conduct, conducted an, an initial public offering on NASDAQ, congratulations. Um, your bank is primarily based in South Florida, but you have technology operations in Ohio, I believe. Uh, what have you done and, and what are you doing in response to the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, great. Thanks, Mike. And it's a pleasure to be on uh, this panel with the other guests. And uh, thanks to the Milken Institute for having me. Um, you know, I'd echo a bit of what Mary said. The scale and velocity of the CARES Act has, has been unprecedented which really tested the corporate agility of many of the institutions. Now, in many cases, um, you know, size was advantageous in responding to this. And in some cases, in other aspects of the traditional banking model, size was a disadvantage. And so organizing your people, optimizing the org chart and getting the workflows uh, to, to work in response to the immediate needs. You know, one example would be the, you know, the triple P program was paramount and we had very little time as an industry to, to, to react, um, uh, synthesize all of the information that was coming out from the regulatory agencies and execute on it. And so uh, as it relates to professional bank, um, we repurposed about a third of our org chart to, to become overnight specialists on the triple P. Um, we uh, set up ways to communicate, not, not only you know, internally amongst ourselves, um, but with, with our clients, um, we, we were, before the crisis, um, considered a lower volume um, but high touch institution. And overnight, we needed to um, re-engineer a bit of that where we, tr we tried to maintain the high touch aspects of the way we had done business, but get used to a lot more volume. And some of it was was new new digital channels at which you know people were interacting with, and so uh, you know I'm really proud of our team. We reacted um, well, well to it, and we had a great a great team. You mentioned we've got an office in Cleveland. That's our digital team. Um, we've got our information security officer up there, our head of digital and chief information officer. And um, I, I'm blessed to have these guys for for a smaller bank. We brought this team on about a year and a half ago. And so we had, we had already uh, tested our server load uh, for our, our VPN and digital encryption internally, as well as set up some of these uh, work workflows um, ahead of time. Our, our, our bank was using Microsoft Teams uh, starting a year ago. And so when everybody had to start working from home, it was a real easy thing for us to do. We've got 90% of our staff working uh, from, from home. And quite frankly, uh, over the last 60 days, I've been a bit surprised to the upside how smooth things were been. Now, we are continuing to learn every day on, on what we can do better in this new normal. And we are continuing to revisit and evaluate uh, the structure of our org chart and make sure we've got the right people in the right places to respond to the new way of transacting. As it relates to those who still need a branch and still need to visit their money for some reason or transact at a branch, um, we're, we're doing it at the door. You know, we're really putting our employees and clients uh, health uh, as a priority. And so we've had people uh, come to the door. Um, one of our professionals will come out and, and uh, figure out what kind of transaction they need, what they need to uh, uh, check cash um, or some other service. Um, and thus far, we found it to work uh, pretty well. Great, thanks. So Chris, um, you lead 16 different offices in the United States, Canada, and Mexico for one of the leading financial technology or FinTech companies. And overall, Finastra has over 60 offices located around the world. Uh, you provide technology solutions ranging from the largest global financial institution as well as smaller community banks and credit unions. Now, when I think back to the end of last year and the beginning of this year, when people first started talking about the coronavirus, I noticed that tech companies like Finastra, uh, particularly ones with global presence, were the first companies that began to take this seriously and aggressively start preparing for the possible uh, pandemic. 
uh, such as you know implementing work at home from home plans, reducing travel, and all those things. Give us some insight into how uh, Finastra has been responding uh, to the pandemic. Sure, absolutely, Mike. <clears throat> First, I'd like to say very happy to be here. Um, Milken Foundation is um, Milken Institute is a exceptional partner uh, with Finastra uh, with an ongoing relationship. So anything we can do to spread any wisdom or knowledge is appreciated. Um, well, with respect to um, the impact of um, COVID and virtual working. In mid-March, we took immediate measures to move our global workforce of 11,000 workers to remote working, um, a task we accomplished in less than four days. Now, as you rightly pointed out, as a global company with 60 offices around the world and customers in 133 countries, we were used to virtual collaboration tools, and utilization of them like Microsoft Teams, Lego, et cetera, and had many of the tools we now use uh, already in place. Second, uh, as a provider of mission critical banking software, we have a global business continuity planning uh, that is tested regularly, including disaster recovery and business resiliency. So when we move the workforce virtually, we had a high level of confidence that we'd pull it off in a relatively short amount of time because we knew we were able to do it because we've tested it many times before. Um, and finally, uh, we operate in a rapidly evolving market driven by digitalization and technology innovation. Part of our ongoing mandate is to develop creative ways for our solutions to connect uh, and connect with our, our customers, including the development uh, of the end-to-end -end processing and virtual execution of SBA PPP lending, uh, which we developed in less than two weeks prior to the first round of funding of $349 billion. Great, great, great. thanks. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mary, so let me let me turn to you and talk about um, how your customers have responded and, and the changing uh, needs that they have. So, so Wells Fargo provides financial services to over 20 million retail bank households and like more than 3 million small business owners, right? It, it, how, how are your customers doing? Um, what changes and trends have you noticed in terms of their banking needs? So, for example, we've heard you know, people don't want to touch cash anymore and they're not going to the ATM. We've heard stories about, you know, loan documentation having to be signed through the drive through and things like that. You know, Dan was telling us about meeting customers at the door. Talk to us about your customers. How, how are they doing? What are you seeing in terms of their behavior and their, and their changing needs? So we um, have, as you said, 20, uh, 5,300 or so branches. About 25, 27% of those are closed today. But the other branches are operating in one of four formats. Um, typically, those involve a drive-through. Uh, we've seen the value of drive-through in a way that we probably haven't appreciated as an industry as much as over the last several weeks. Uh, branches, many branches by appointment. We've installed plexiglass shields in 3,700 locations to provide protection for customers and employees. Um, but we still see, on average, 850,000 to a million customers a day who come to one of our branches. So they still want uh, some sort of interaction, whether it's drive through or uh, lobby largely by appointment. Um, but we've also seen behavior changes. We've increased limits to uh, for mobile deposit capture and um, ATM withdrawals, immediate credit availability of stimulus checks. But uh, we've seen the mobile deposit activity up 80% plus year over year and dollars in mobile deposit up something like 87% from just February to April. So people have leaned into digital in a way that they may have used it in the past. Now they've really learned how to use it. So we're using it for messaging. We're using it for transactions. We're thinking about how we accommodate more how we can allow bankers to do things over the phone when that's a more comfortable um, interaction for the customer. Um, we've used our um, contact centers and our voice uh, uh, capabilities differently to allow deferments, whether it's by mobile for, for customers who needed help, mobile or um, through one of our, our voice units. So we've tried to really both lead and flex to what our customers need and want. Um, and, you know, in our, our home lending business, for instance, we're in many states where it's allowed uh, doing virtual uh, appointments and virtual closings, if that's what we can do. We've changed the way we um, look at appraisals. 
Uh, we're not doing taking appraisals inside of customer's home because customers aren't as comfortable with that anymore. So we've really just tried to think about the behavioral changes, some of which will stick and some of which may morph over time and, um, and we'll track and move with that. So Dan, you mentioned that um, you, you are, your bank is known for its concierge service, which is, which is very high touch. Um, and you've mentioned that um, you've adapted by meeting folks sort of at the door and, um, you know, substituting um, digital in, in some cases. Is, are, are you finding that, that folks are embracing the technology? Do you have a cohort of people who just want to make sure, you know, like Mary said, they still have customers that still want to come in and, and, and see people? And, and how, are you, how are you managing that and how are you thinking through things differently? Yeah, I would tell you that, I, I, you know, I firmly believe people will always want to be able to go visit their money and talk to somebody. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest that the digital tools are a substitute. Um, the digital tools are, are a complement. And I would tell you that over the last uh, two months, can't tell you how many versions uh, of, uh, of the following statement I've heard from various clients uh, of the bank, many of which are new, but um, they've forgotten what the value is of having a re relationship with the bank beyond digital tools. Um, you know, being able to call that branch manager and have some sort of personal relationship to talk about these really extraordinary things that are happening with their business, with their loan, with, with their checking account. And so there's no substitute for the human element. And, 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 and I wanna be clear on that. As it relates to the digital tools though, um, I, we're seeing the same thing with Mary. There, there's there's less need for cash. People don't want to touch the cash. And um, with respect to m mobile uh, de deposits, taking a picture of the checks with your phone or the, the remote uh, deposit capture machines that are for more high volume users, as small businesses, mid sized businesses. Um, you know th those are are active and, and, and will continue to be active. We we also um, developed this did pull forward. Um, so, some demand uh, utilization and quite frankly, some um, employee or a client education on a new payment app, a P2P payment app that, that we um, are utilizing, sort of use, utilizing it maybe uh, six to seven months ago, um, but it's because of the pandemic, uh, the absence of cash or not wanting to touch the cash people have learned to, to use this really cool feature inside of our mobile app where you can send money uh, free and immediately uh, and fast with immediate clearing uh, without having to download uh, uh, an additional app such as Venmo or Zelle. And the recipient doesn't need to be a member of the Zelle uh, directory, uh, no, nor does it have to d download any app itself. We're transferring money with, um, uh, just need a, a cell phone number or an email address, uh, and I can send you a link where you can enter your uh, debit card number uh, and the expiration date. That's it. We don't see it, but we use the debit card rails uh, to, to move the money that quickly. And that's something that perhaps would have taken us a year or two uh, to educate our clients on and, and, and compel them or ask them to use. And all of a sudden, um, due, due to the pandemic, uh, people are seeking ways to, to move money around fee and fat, free and fast. Uh, and so we've been a net beneficiary in that regard as it relates to some of our features such as uh, our P2P app. Yeah, same, you know, on the, on the mobile payment side, right? It was always, it was very striking to me. Five years ago, I went, I, had, I made a trip to Africa and you see, Places like Kenya with their M-Pesa system, that they were, you know, years ahead of the United States in this mobile payment system. I think, and I thought, you know, what's what's it going to take for us to embrace something as efficient, as effective as this, or and and you know, cost effective as this? And I think this may be the catalyst for that. And what you're saying, you're absolutely right. Now, I'll share another uh, point with you. It, it's it's right along those so same lines. So we're part of this uh, this um, nonprofit that every year or so ago we we host um, banking executives from an, an emerging uh, or developing country um, that has a, um, uh, a, a less mature banking industry. And so this was about a year and a half, two years ago, we um, hosted uh, a banking group from Mongolia. This uh, consisted of um, a number of their executives, one or two directors, uh, a, a governance person, 
um, they spent a week with us um, looking over our shoulders. They wanted to learn best practices on not only how we view credit, but um, certain uh, technological aspects, corporate governance issues, et cetera. And so they had spent a week with us and we were at the last meeting uh, of the week and at which time they kind of shared and, and what they learned from us were very appreciative. And towards the end, I, I called a timeout and I said, you know, do, do you mind if I ask you a question? I'd like to learn from you. Because we were just getting into um, putting an emphasis on these digital and mobile, mobile tools. And this was right before we had hired this digital team out of Cleveland. And I asked these folks, uh, of the last 100 clients that you had acquired, new clients, how many of them were through a digital channel? Um, and, and they told me 35%. And that, that is shocking. Now, th there's a handful of digital only banks here in the US and they really don't spend uh, resources on bricks and mortar or traditional banking channels to acquire new clients. Um, but when you look at uh, banks that, that, that do uh, both well, and, and, and by, by, by the way, I, that, that's what I believe. I, I don't think there's a, uh, an all digital solution or, or just bricks and mortar. I think the banks that are gonna do really well over the years they do, do, do both well. But I was shocked. Here you've got a place in, in Mongolia that is is using digital tools, and they're a traditional bank over there. But they, they have figured out how to tap their market and attract new new clients uh, through through digital channels m much better than many of the banks here in the U U.S. are doing with with the same tools. It's fascinating. Yeah, very fascinating. So. So Chris, you know, Finastra's customers are in fact the, the financial institutions, the banks that then deal with the customers. And we've heard from Mary and Dan, some of the, the changes that the customers uh, are, are, are demanding from them. Um, what are you seeing? Uh, what changes have you noticed in terms of the technology needs of, of the banks and, and credit unions um, that are your clients? And what new technology solutions uh, have you had to develop uh, during the pandemic? Sure. I think it, let me start this answer with a quote from Winston Churchill, never let a good crisis go to waste. And I think Dan and Mary alluded to some of the innovation that was birthed as a result of responding to COVID-19. But what he meant was that in challenging times, one must question the accepted reality because things are going wrong. Rapid answers and innovation is required. And typically that innovation is found outside of the usual compass. Um, and for us, a good example of this was how the SBA Payroll Protection Act program really shed a light on the deficiencies uh, of the traditional physical bank branching, uh, branch banking model, and particularly how it impacted the community banking market. Automation and throughput associated with loan processing became critical dependency for many institutions who historically ran a high touch, low volume uh, loan business. So as such, many of the regional banks relying on branch banking, uh, origination and execution were forced into a virtual model overnight. Uh, now, as a provider of loan processing software to thousands of community banks, we were able to virtualize our loan processing and execution software by embedding automated tools like digital document production, e-signature, and online notary support for our clients, uh, enabling many to see a 15-time increase in loan throughput on the SBA side. So, And for us, um, they are now innovation and capabilities that will be embedded in part of everything we do going forward uh, to prepare for the new norm. Yeah, I mean, I think when I think when I think, you know, when I the reasons why I go to a branch, it's almost always the same thing, right? Whether it's opening a new account or loan documentation or get something notarized, right? And and what you're saying is you're you're offering solutions to folks. You can do that all online now, right? I just I signed a legal document recently. I think it was DocuSign or something like that, that I never what would have thought we would have been able to do something. It, yeah, and, and you see the impact and something like PPP. I mean, you know, 14 years and 14 days. I mean, the, the, they did more volume in 14 days than the SBA has done in the last 14 years. So yeah. um, when you look at many of the banks that I was personally engaged with, where they had individual employees coming back into the branch, opening up the drive-through window so that their customers can pull in and execute SPA, PP loan documents yeah. to get the required funding. And the pace at which that first round of 349 billion went in five days um, was such that many of these local communities and their customers you know, were left out. 
of the initial rounds of funding. So uh, really forcing people to look at things differently. And that, that, that made it real, particularly for me. Yeah, so yeah. I want to, you've all mentioned the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP, and I want to, for the next round of questions, uh, I want I want to dig into that. And Chris, I'll start with you. But first, I want to remind the audience that um, we're res reserving some time uh, to answer audience questions. So um, if you want to submit questions, go to the bottom right corner of your screen and use the Q&A feature. Um, and we'll try to get to as many of your questions uh, as we can during this hour. Um, I have plenty of questions, but um, what's maybe more important is questions that you all have. So um, looking forward to those. So, um, uh, you know, you've all mentioned the Paycheck Protection Program, and just for the benefit of our audience who may not be familiar, familiar with that program, it was created as part of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security, or CARES Act, to provide direct incentive for small businesses to keep their workers on their payroll. Um, as you all have mentioned, it's, it's a Small Business Administration lo loan program. It's supported by the Department of Treasury. And businesses, the way they apply for it, the PPP loans, is, is through banks, credit unions, and other approved regulated uh, lenders as the intermediaries. I mean, this is, this, is, this is quite striking to me, the fact that if you think back to the global financial crisis where uh, you know, no offense, where banks were part of the problem. Um, now it's clear that the banks are part of the solution. Uh, and in fact, a big part of the solution in terms of, you know, getting stimulus money in the hands of people uh, as quick as possible and trying to figure out how to match the, the small businesses that need the money and deserve the money um, with the money that is available. Um, and banks are playing that critical role in the middle. So, so Chris, let me start with you. Um, you know, you mentioned that you are helping more lenders participate in the PPP program so that, you know, small businesses can get the capital they need uh, for their employees. Um, you're, you guys are doing some really cool things to really help underserved communities, in particular with minority deposit institutions um, and community development financial institutions. Can you can you talk to us a little bit about um, uh, the services you're providing there and the cost for which you're providing those services to try to get money uh, where it is needed most? Sure, absolutely. Well, Finastra has played a significant role in U.S. banking lending market in particular, uh, both processing and execution of commercial and retail loans uh, for over 4,000 institutions annually. Um, our mission is to unlock the power of people and potential everywhere. It's an altruistic vision, but essentially what it means is we will do well by doing good, right? and that drives uh, much of our thinking. Um, so prior to the first tranche of $349 billion of SBA PPP funding, we concentrated our development to create a fully automated end-to-end -end SBA PPP processing solution uh, that includes you know, visualizing the application inputs that banks can plug into their own portals, automating the SBA processing, uh, including automatic documentation production and notification, and then virtualizing the document production and execution of the SBA PPP loans. So we offered it immediately to our existing customer base at no additional charge to get them ready uh, to process the first round. So to date, uh, we had about 800 lenders that have processed 75,000 loans over the platform. But one of the interesting observations was after the first round, on analyzing the concentration of the capital associated with the first tranche, meaning where the capital ended up, um, our founding partner, Robert Smith, Vist Equity Partners, along with Secretary Mnuchin and the L. Sharkman Foundation began to seek ways to prepare uh, financial institutions that are serving minor minority um, and or underserved markets to receive their fair share for the second round of 310 billion. So uh, we identified two key constraints that really impacted these communities from um, receiving the, the appropriate allocation. One was the lack of technology automation and throughput um, simply didn't have the manpower, the automation to process right, the loans. And then there was a second dynamic of liquidity, which was interesting. So within we, a week uh, prior to the second round, we onboarded uh, 30 community developed financial institutions, as well as an additional 22 of the members of the National Bankers Association, which is a minority owned association of banks uh, to prepare them for the second round. But we also uh, partnered with some of our key enterprise clients like Citi and Bank of America um, to help solve the liquidity piece. So we teamed with City and Bank of America to provide 
low cost FDIC insured deposits to those very same institutions. So we wanted to uh, tackle both the technology automation and throughput problem, uh, but we also wanted to secure the liquidity and we accomplished both prior to the second round. So it was truly a rewarding experience to see what we can do in such a short amount of time. And you know, in terms of innovation from our perspective, we would have never dreamed that we can onboard 30 individual institutions in a day and a half with an end-to-end -end loan processing and execution solution. But we did it. Wow. Because we were forced to think about doing it differently. Yeah. And then these are practices that will continue to utilize the forward. Yeah. No, no, that I mean that's amazing, right? I mean, this is unprecedented in terms of thinking through how the banking system, you know, the government is 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 relying on the banking system. And then they're looking to you for technology solutions, particularly the small ones, and to mobilize to get the capital where it's needed most. Now, let me turn let me turn to Mary. So Wells Fargo, you know, given given your size and then also just given your efforts and in, in leading into this, you, you all have been a national leader in processing uh, PPP loan applications that have been able um, to get um, to get capital um, to to folks who need it. Both, you know, it's, it's a work in progress, as Chris mentioned. There's different tranches and 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 it, it's kind of you know it's we've never done anything like this before. The size and scale of this um, is is something that the SBA is not used to. Treasury supporting them, and they're kind of going out with a rolling series of FAQs, frequently asked questions, to get customers more certainty in terms of what qualifies, in terms of giving banks more certainty in terms of um, you know the regulatory requirements and all those sorts of things. So, given the fact that Wells has been a national leader in this, tell us about uh, your PPP efforts. Well, it, it's really not unlike what Chris has described at, uh, at, at the scale that we would serve with the customer base that we have. So we've secured over 150,000 uh, SBA guarantees for customers. And the interesting thing to me are the customers that we're helping. So um, over 50% of the loans that we've done are under $25,000 and 80% of the customers who have secured guarantees um, have 10 or fewer employees. So we feel really good that it's going to the businesses who are perhaps feeling uh, the most stress or certainly elevated levels of stress in the environment. Uh, we're still working with customers who, because we have an obligation to review the documentation as part of the facilitating institution. And we're still working with customers whose initial documentation may not have supported the application, but they are uh, are very interested in providing us what we need to ensure that we can pass that uh, uh, loan application along to the SBA. So it is a work in process. As you said, the, the clarity continues to come out from the SBA. We're now focusing our attention on helping those customers so that we can ensure that those loans really become grants and are um, meet the, the requirements, the back end requirements that those companies need to fulfill with the SBA. So um, it's taken um, a, a lot of technology, as, as Chris mentioned, to process in that volume, but also a lot of people because of the review uh, responsibility that we have on the front end. And, uh, and it's a stressful time. It's a very stressful time for our customers. And we wanna make sure that the combination of supporting them in deferment of existing uh, facilities that may have in place um, as well as the securing of a, an SBA guarantee through the PPP program, that combination of support has been really important and rewarding to the folks that we have been able to work with. Great. So Dan, you mentioned that professional bank, you know, moved very quickly and leveraged your existing technology to, to process PPP loan applications. It, it, please tell us about, um, you know, how the, the, the success of those. <laughs> Yeah, sure. So um, we report our Q1 earnings on Friday, so I'm a bit reluctant to get into the details, um, but I can say that um, we got every bit of our fair share uh, of the program in a big chunk of, um, of uh, the, the deals that, that we, we completed. We're not just for existing clients, uh, but, but for new clients. And these were uh, other um, uh, clients that had um, uh, primary banking relationships with other institutions for whatever reason, wasn't getting the traction done. And, and so we're, we're really proud uh, to be able to have this opportunity 
um, uh, in a time of uh, stress, duress, and disorientation to be able to execute and, and demonstrate our, our value proposition to, to the community. There's a number of small businesses, um, uh, j jobs that we've not only saved Palm Beach, Broward, and, and Miami-Dade County, um, but through uh, our, our digital channels and our team, we've acquired new clients all over the country. And these are not just new clients that transacted with us once through the Triple P. These are folks that are opening up uh, checking accounts with us, that are opening up money market accounts with us. And so um, I, uh, I'm really proud of our team. Uh, and, you know, responding to the question about, you know, how, how we did this, I would tell you halfway through uh, round one of the Triple P, we started introducing some of uh, these automation features. Our digital team had, had developed, worked with a vendor to implement some of these things. And um, we, we created a schematic to figure out the workflows to you know, taking someone's application and ver verifying the information, submitting for an E-Tran number, collecting the appropriate signatures and so forth. And it was fascinating what we use using existing software we had or implementation of other, but there were certain aspects of the assembly line, if you will, that were taking 25 minutes for a human to do. Um, we had automated and a lot of it was just the redundant um, transfer of information from one disparate uh, uh, <coughs> information to another. But it was taking 25 minutes down to a minute, down to 30 seconds, and it was tremendous. And so we were able to repurpose some people even further within the assembly line to focus on those choke points and re really optimize the bandwidth to which we can help people and, and get them submitted. I think the next thing that all of us are going to be focused on over the next two months is the forgiveness aspect of, of, of the Triple P. And, um, you know, I, I don't recall um, a federal program or, or any program that matter where you've closed a loan, funded a loan, and oh, by the way, we're still kind of figuring out what the rules are, what some of the details are. Now, I think the spirit uh, of the program uh, will supersede any of these concerns, the spirit being, you know, saving jobs and, and keeping people uh, safe and, and these businesses alive. But it's going to be real interesting over the next uh, two, two to three months as um, uh, some of uh, the loan proceeds is depleted. You're coming up on these periods where these loans can, can, can be forgiven. And uh, I think the, the next uh, wave of dealing with this is, is again, synthesizing all of the, the voluminous amount of information that comes in and, and executing on it and, and making sure that banks don't get put in an awkward position with some of their existing and or new clients where they might have thought that certain dollars should be forgiven and, and now they're not. And I think that that is gonna be um, re really important how banks handle the forgiveness aspect relative to the expectations of those PPP applicants that have been using these proceeds. Yeah, so that you bring up a good point there, right? A very good point about you know the, the, the questions about forgiveness. Uh, on this, right? So even beyond PPP, let's go beyond there and talk about sort of the unprecedented role that, that banks have to uh, provide to society, right? So thinking beyond your shareholders, thinking beyond um, your regulatory obligations and those types of things, you're being asked to do certain things, like an extraordinary amount of, of, of for, forbearance in the loans and the regulators, yes, are giving some comfort, as you all have mentioned, before on there, but um, I don't think people appreciate um, all the things that, that banks are having to do um, in, in, in this pandemic. So, so Mary, let me turn to you as, you know, as one of the, you know, the largest lenders and, and mortgage servicers in the country, right? It's, it's one thing for, um, you know, for, for landlords to say to, you know, residents, you know, you don't have to pay your mortgage this month or whatever it is, but as a mortgage servicer, there's investors on the other side that are looking for that money and, 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 and loans that are on your balance sheet. You have regulatory obligations, you have obligations to, to, your, to your shareholders and the like. So how are you balancing the need to maintain, let's talk, let me ask you about safety and soundness and, and dealing with the regulators uh, of your institution with, with the needs of your customers and then just think of, you know, society as a whole and the right thing to do here. 
Well, you have described really well exactly where we are in terms of balancing those two things. We've got, um, uh, I think, 1.7 million customers who have contacted us for some sort of relief or deferment, uh, some fee. Some of that is in terms of fees. Some of that is in terms of deferment between four and five billion dollars of principal and interest. Um, and, and about half of that is on loan service for others. So it's exactly where we are and how do we uh, fulfill our responsibility as, um, as a servicer, but also make it really a frictionless experience for customers who are in need of help. And then the next opportunity will be how do we work with them as we get to the 90 day mark or whatever it might be to say, all right, what does this look like going forward? What's the opportunity? Um, that the customer may have to rethink the way that um, that they are able to satisfy that debt going forward. So our responsibility up front or our opportunity up front was really to make it easy for customers, but at the same time, ensure that customers aren't taking on debt that uh, could be problematic down the road so that there's a responsibility in the current environment. We're seeing draws on um, uh, either small business or uh, consumer debt or a higher incidence of revolving credit. Um, but again, how do we think about the way we work with customers to ensure that that debt going forward that they're adding is is not putting in a substantial burden that they'll later regret. So it really is that balance of helping and um, and helping to be responsible. Yeah, I can imagine that. I mean, your folks that are that are working on that, if, if this is the amount of time they spend on this, it's it, have we ever seen anything like it? I mean, was the global financial crisis even close to this or is this just well in, in, in um, not in the speed at which we're making changes without all the information that you might have otherwise wanted to have. All of us know that we've got a certain amount of information. We're getting new information every day, but the right answer is not to do nothing. And so how do we use what we have and lean into that in a way that creates the, the kind of space with today's information to take action? So I don't think so. But the other thing we'll see is the way behavior will change for our customers. We saw a different behavior in the, um, in the last recession. We'll see a different, we're seeing it with stimulus checks. You know, in the prior recessions, if um, stimulus money was spent in different ways, you saw larger dollar purchases, you might have seen something um, that affected the economy differently. Today, we're seeing it spent on groceries and takeout food and catch up on bills. So we'll also be all watching the consumer behavior, which will change with the dynamics of, of the situation that we're in and the duration as we see this thing play out. Yeah, all right, thanks. So, so Dan, you, you know, as we mentioned, you're a newly public company. Um, and as a former SEC commissioner, I appreciate the fact that you were not front running your, your, your quarterly earnings reports or in, your, in your quarterly <laughs> reporting. So, it's, so that's very good. But, but let me ask you a similar question to, to Mary, right? Asked her about balancing it with safety and soundness. How, how do you balance, um, you know, things like forbearance um, and those types of things, you know, the needs of your customers with the fiduciary uh, responsibility to your shareholders? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I'll back up for a minute and just start by saying that I think there is a lot of merit to many aspects of the stakeholder cap capitalism. And so, you know, not, not just, you know, bank versus borrower or bank regulator, you know, bank uh, auditors, et cetera. You know, our philosophy or professional bank is to, to, to construct win-win scenarios for, for us or our clients, uh, us and our regulatory authorities, uh, uh, us and our, you know our, our shareholders, et cetera, and and I think for the most part, if you are going to develop a sustainable business time business plan that that will survive throughout time uh, in the market gyrations that that come with that, you know, ha having a, a win win attitude towards these types of decisions is is really important. So. You know, as it relates to the banking industry, you know, we're one of, if not the most regulated industry in, in the country. Um, and I would tell you, a lot of the practices and behaviors of the banking industry are largely a function and or reaction of the, the, the intended and unintended consequences of good and, and bad policy uh, that is typically born out of previous recessions. And I'll, I'll give, give you an example. But... You know, most recently, and I applaud the Fed and FASB for doing this, but 
um, not, not having to classify certain loans as you know late pays or troubled debt, debt restructures um, what was huge that that enables us to utilize a common sense approach um, to help borrowers um, um, through this time of uncertainty and and it, it ranges from you know converting some loans just to, to interest only uh, other loan loans we, we might be waiving the requirement to escrow for taxes insurance so some loans it's an outright uh, deferral of, of loan payments for a specified period of time but uh, allowing the, the fed and fasb allowing banks to deal with their borrowers in a common sense way with the long-term uh, relationship in place it, it has been great and and, and again I, I applaud them for allowing banks to do that absent that banks would be in a very difficult spot right now um, and it would create some perhaps perverse behavior by by one or two of the constituents in, in, in this situation right now um, we want to help our borrowers uh, and our clients and, and, and simply want to do it in such a way that that if the roles were reversed um, they would be helping us. And that's kind of the philosophy we take here is that you know, we, we treat those the way we want to be treated in ourselves. We're pleased that we get to be a part of the solution this time. I think when there's a, a post-mortem analysis of, of, of what happened and all of the actions that the government took to uh, address the health concerns of, the, uh, 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 of its constituents, as well as um, the social impacts, I, I'm fortunate and very grateful to be in a position to, to be able to help folks. Uh, you know, our, our teams over here view themselves as uh, the economic uh, first responders to this crisis. You know, you've got the, the health workers that are helping folks uh, in the hospitals get, get better from a health perspective. Um, we, we've been the first responders to a lot of small businesses that would otherwise be um, seeking, you know, bankruptcy protection in the courts, um, you know, laying off folks, and but, but now we're able, able to bring them back, staying current on utilities, rent payments, and so forth. And so we're really proud to be able to serve a role in this and, 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 and are seeking a win-win outcome uh, for, uh, for not, not only us, our borrowers, but of course, uh, our, our regulatory authorities and our shareholders. I like that phrase, economic first responders. Yeah. I'm going to steal that. Um, and I'll give you credit for it going forward. So I think that's great. Um, we've got a number of questions from the audience. So so let me turn to a couple of those. Chris, let me get you in first on this one. Um, somebody somebody wanted to know, you know, as 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 we're, as banks are moving more digital, um, what what risks do you see around cybersecurity? And then I'll go to uh, Mary and then Dan in terms of your bank too, right? Are are you, are you seeing and 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 you know from from the I guess well, so your, well, your customers are the banks. So are the banks more at risk? Are we seeing an uptick in the type of cybersecurity, a, a, a downtick because people are busy doing other things right now? What, what, what are we seeing from your perspective? And then I'll, I'll get um, Mary and Dan in terms of, um, you know, not only your institution, but in terms of dealing you know, your customers too, so that they're not victims. Yeah, well, I think uh, in, in general, uh, what we've seen particularly among um, small institutions is, you know, there's a general, um, you know, desire to understand the impact of moving more aggressively to cloud-based technologies, right? Um, theoretically, um, you know, there's a perception that anything on the cloud can potentially be hacked. Um, but when you peel back the onion a bit and you understand you know, the, the infrastructure associated with you know, native cloud enablement and the security protocols from a technology perspective, um, you realize the power of leveraging the cloud ecosystem to protect things like customer data uh, and or the risk of infiltration. Um, you know, we've seen that countless times where some of the safest um, applications that have um, seen intrusion or uh, cyber activity uh, have been you know, on the Microsoft Azure cloud uh, because of the stack and the protections that the software provides. So I think it's more just uh, a desire for information. Um, you know, and particularly uh, regulated entities like the bank industry in the US, uh, many of the regulators are also on a learning curve with respect to digital technologies in the cloud. And many of the existing regulations you know, don't account for um, you know, certain nuances associated with how 
you know, the, the cloud ecosystem can protect things like customer data. Um, so I think what we're seeing mostly is a desire for information uh, with, the, with the general belief that it's inevitable that you know, many, if not all of these technologies at some point in the bank industry will be virt um, um, virtual you know, in a cloud environment, right? So it's a journey and what we're seeing is more of a quest and a desire for real information, which is a role we play. So Mary, I can't imagine, you know, the, the amount of, you know, cybersecurity things that you have to deal with, with su from such a large bank as yours, right? I mean, that would just keep me up at night to worry about this stuff, right? So wh wh where does that fall in terms of things that you worry about and, and how has the pandemic sort of changed that in the move to digital? Well, we have a lot of people who stay up all night, every night, uh, making sure it's not a problem, but it's something that pandemic or no, we're focused on all the time. I mean, it's one of those really key risk areas that we watch and monitor closely. Um, and particularly as we have, as I said, 200,000 of our employees who are working from home, how do we make sure we've enabled them with all of the right equipment, all the right connection points so that, um, that they're protected through our um, network at all times. Um, but a big part of what we're doing is making sure our customers are educated. So what are we seeing? How do we share that back with customers? How do we help them understand um, that a lot of these attempts may not be for fraud or, um, or other is cyber issues may not be through their bank, but for them um, directly. So we take what we see and then we use it to educate, uh, which is I think one of our best defenses uh, for customers in particular. So it's, it's not only our, um, needs, which we're super vigilant about and have heightened that even more. Um, but how do we help our customers? Because some of those issues occur with them. Um, and then as it, as they interact with us. So, you know, I wouldn't say, uh, we're seeing different kinds of, uh, issues and fraud crop up, uh, which we anticipate. Um, and that's the, that's the thing we're trying to do is stay ahead of that so we can anticipate it. And you can see with things like the large stimulus check payments or something like that as those programs, which have been, as we've said, deployed in an amazing way as our lawmakers came together to make something happen really fast. Um, there are unfortunately uh, situations where folks are trying to look at and take advantage of those. We just don't want our customers to be victims of it. Yeah. So Dan, let me let me ask you some similar question, right? How 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 are how are you thinking through this? Has 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 the pandemic changed the game with respect to cyber? Is it in terms of the types of attacks you're seeing, or uptick in terms of level activity? And, and as your customers move to digital, how do you get them? How do you, and yeah, you know, similar. Do you have education efforts? Well, I I think that the 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 risk associated with the threat of uh, cyber crime is no greater or no less than it was, you know, post-crisis versus pre-crisis. Um, th there are, I've heard of, of, of a few new, new methods, uh, uh, you know, to, to try to get folks to click on something where they're, they're, you know, selling or offering, you know, N95 masks or, you know, uh, inviting someone to a virtual happy hour or something that the, so, so it might might be a, a kind of a, a new um, hook, hook or trapped, but but I, I think that, that uh, you know the, the cyber criminals are you know were, were, were just as as hard at work pre-crisis as, as perhaps they are now. I, I would tell you though that I think um, similar to what Mary said is that uh, employee and client education is is paramount. Um, the more you can educate uh, your clients. Uh, and ri raise the situational awareness around some of these things is paramount. S same thing with the employees. You know, cybercrime or the risk associated there with is, is so hard to measure. Um, you know, it's one thing if you, you make a, a couple of bad loans or bad investments as a bank, well, at least you can quantify that. You can collar that and you can, you can understand that. I think the concern for not only banks, but, but all in industries is you, you don't know, you cannot measure the, the risk associated with it. You cannot measure in terms of dollars 
of what, what it might cost an institution. You can't measure the reputational cost that, that you might incur as a result of this. And so when you can't measure the potential downside, it's hard to measure the appropriate um, spend and resource allocation you should be making on the other side. So what do prudent banks or other industry leaders do is, is they will um, um, do, do as, as much as they possibly can. It's one of these price insensitive or cost insensitive line items on everybody's uh, uh, bu budget every year because you, you know that, that, that you have the potentially unlimited downside in some of these respects you need to cover it. it. It's always been an important aspect of our institution and, and, and uh, certainly with the adoption of more of these digital uh, tools and the usage of some of these, these mobile uh, services being increased, you know, we're certainly gonna stay, stay ahead and, and, and stay aligned uh, with, with that and keep them, keep them safe. Thanks. So um, we're coming up to uh, the, the, the top of the hour. So we only got time for uh, one more question, but we, got, we, we received a number of very good questions uh, from the audience. In fact, two sort of stand out. So here's what we'll do. We'll, do, we'll have to do sort of a lightning round and I'll answer, ask two questions and you can each of you choose to answer one, whichever one you want to answer. One is, um, what is your favorite story in terms of a customer or client um, that you've been able to help uh, during this crisis? Um, or you can choose to answer the other question in terms of long term, right? We've already talked about things that you're doing to adapt um, in terms of your branches, right? In terms of bricks and mortar, but people are moving more towards digital, but they're still going to come in to, 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 to the branch every once in a while. What does that look like three to five years from now? How much of this is permanent and how much of it are we going to go back to the old way of thinking? And how does that then think about, you know, the branch rationalization strategy? So either your favorite story or predict the future in three to five years. And so, um, Chris, why don't you go first and then we'll go Mary and then finish with Dan. Uh, okay, so I'll, 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 I'll take my shot at predicting the future. <laughs> I think essentially uh, the, the brick and mortar world has been reset. And what that reset will mean in the long term is not yet clear until we fully emerge into recovery, but I think that there is now a behavior that's baked, right? As you've noticed from the anecdotes from Mary and Dan, um, and those behaviors center around a couple key themes, right? One is the penetration of digital platforms across all industries, right? Um, and bankers being the financial first responders, which I love, um, you, know, you know, we're kind of immersed as a result of uh, PPP. Um, but in general, it's impacting, impacting every industry. Um, new work guidelines, right, with a focus on keeping people safe, including uh, an ongoing balance of virtual work, which I think will persist. Um, and I think finally, the new reliance on digital exchanges uh, in industries with traditional physical supply chain. So a transformation there. I think those are the key three trends that we'll see in terms of what the new norm becomes. Um, I'm going to drop in one quick anecdote because uh, this is a touching story. Um, when we onboarded, uh, one of the institutions we onboarded for the second round, 94% um, of their local customers were sold to partnerships, and they were unable to participate in the first round of capital. And watching the process and being with them and onboarding and actually supporting them process their first loans uh, was a truly reward, rewarding experience. And it's, it's kind of nice to think that if we didn't do what we did, um, they wouldn't have had that opportunity. So I, I had to throw that in there. Uh, All right. Well, a, little, a little bit of cheating with doing both, but that's, that's okay. All right, Mary, go ahead. So Chris did a good job of, of predicting the future. So I'll tell you a story. <laughs> and, um, and it speaks to what he said in terms of uh, the role of digital going forward. But as Dan mentioned earlier, the importance of people. Uh, but I mentioned earlier that for our customers who receive stimulus checks, if they had a negative balance, at the time the stimulus check was to be deposited, uh, either ACH or they brought it into our branch, we set aside, temporarily set aside that negative balance because it was important to us that our customers get access to that money. It wasn't to, to satisfy an obligation to the bank, it was for them to use. And so we had a customer named Sarah drive into one of our drive through lines with a car full of kids and in the back seat. And she came to our drive through as a number of customers do, and all she asked for was her balance. So our teller prints the balance, sends it back out through the tube, and she gets the balance and she looks at it, pushes a button and said, this has to be wrong. 
said, no, 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 it's right. And, you know, here's your balance. And she said, no, 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 this has to be wrong. He said, well, why don't you pull around and we'll um, uh, come out, somebody will come out to your car and meet you there. And so our branch manager came out to the car and met Sarah at the car. And she explained to her that we had set aside those balances, those negative balances, because it was in, the stimulus money was important. At that point, Sarah started crying and said, you have no idea what this means because now these kids in the back will get fed. Now my rent will get paid. And this, I promise you, I'm going to pay back every penny of it and I'll be a Wells Fargo customer for life. At which point our branch manager said, you don't need to worry about that now. There'll be plenty of time for that. If that doesn't speak to the role, as you said, that we as financial institutions have to lean in and help, then I don't know what does. So we tell stories like that. I get emails. I have the easiest name to spell at Wells Fargo. So I get emails all day long of our team members who want to tell about those kinds of stories. And it really, for as hard as people are working in, um, in conditions that have changed radically over the last six or eight weeks, um, it's really what motivates 270,000 people at our company to do what we do. Wow, that's a great story. Hey, right, Dan. Okay, well, uh, Mary, that's a great story. We've got a, a, a few, you know, versions uh, uh, similar to that, but uh, I think overall, I mean, this has just been a tremendous opportunity to generate that goodwill with customers. And, and, and this is, look, this is not um, uh, when, uh, uh, you know, the character and culture of, of banks or institutions or people are revealed. This is, uh, or sorry, when they're built, this is a building character. This is when institutions are revealing their character. And I think that's great. So I, I'm going to take the predicting the, the, the future. Uh, other, otherwise, I'd just tell you about, you know, a handful of my favorite restaurants in South Florida that we can help with the uh, <laughs> restaurants. But um, so predicting the future, I, I think that, yeah, there, there will be less branches. I think the branches will perhaps be, be smaller. Um, I, I, I do think though that, you know, it's, I read an article this morning that, um, I think it's, uh, a congressman or two is seeking the passage for a law for business to turn people away. If they have a fever, if you could measure the fever in a non-invasive way. And so, um, I don't know how long, um, the, the adverse psychological aftermath of this is going to take and, and perhaps the announcement of a vaccine alleviates these concerns but um when you start re reading about federal law being able to turn people away for certain you know in this case a, a, an ailment of a fever what if it's a fever for something else i, I don't know it, it's, it's very odd uh but but ge generally speaking i, I still think people are going to want to be able to visit their money um, and human beings are, are social creatures. They're going to want to uh, have that two-minute conversation in the parking lot. You, you can't, an app can't capture that experience. And so I don't think uh, branches are going away. Um, I think there's probably a business case to perhaps re reduce some of it and perhaps the footprint gets smaller. But I think that in, in, in the long run, it's the banks that do both well w will continue to capture more market share. Great. And with that, we are we are out of time. And I want to thank all of you, Mary, Dan, and Chris. Thank you so much um, for for such an engaging and enlightening conversation uh, in 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 today's conference call. Um, for folks in the audience to learn more about what the institute is doing in response to the pandemic and how to get involved, you can visit our website at milkeninstitute.org. Uh, resources include a COVID-19 treatment and vaccine tracker, which has received literally hundreds of millions of hits, um, access to all of our previous weekly conference calls, an ongoing podcast series featuring our chairman, Mike Milken, and an array of global thought leaders and the work of all of our uh, centers and more. And for anyone who would uh, like to get involved with the Milken Institute's work, uh, you can feel free to email me. Uh, unlike Mary, uh, I have a last name that is very difficult to spell. Um, you can reach out to me at mpivovar at milkeninstitute.org. It's m-p-i-w-o-w-a-r at milkeninstitute.org. And we look forward to reconvening on our next call.